Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Crossroads. Let's stand up together. Everybody having a fantastic weekend? I like how nobody's sitting right here in the spit zone. Here we go. Yeah, that's right. Right there. Hey, man, good morning. Yeah, right there. That's good. Great to see everyone. Hey, let's lift our hands and let's pray as we begin today. Let's begin our time of praise to the Lord. Jesus, we want to tell you we love you. We're so thankful, Father, for your son, Jesus, that you sent the Holy Spirit. We thank you for salvation and redemption. We thank you that you call us sons and daughters. And so today, as we begin our time of praise, we pray that we would be able to worship you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. God, would you awaken our hearts you awaken our awareness to your presence today as we step in, as we begin to sing, we begin to focus and turn all of our attention to you. We say, Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this place. Jesus, come and bring hope and life. Everyone said amen. Amen. Come on, let's praise the Lord today.
Come on, let's give him praise today. Let's make it loud today.
smile of Jesus on our lives because of what he's done. Amen. Why don't you guys be seated today? Man, is this team rocking today or what? Come on. I mean, not that it's different than last week's team, don't get me wrong. But we're celebrating today, and we're going to celebrate communion today. If you're a guest, welcome to Crossroads. We're glad you're here. As we celebrate communion, we invite you to take communion with us. You don't have to be a member of Crossroads Church. We just uh, ask that you be a follower of Jesus Christ. Just a moment, Franchot, awesome Franchot on the keys over here. He's going to come and lead us in a devotion. And when he's finished, the servers will come and they'll bring the juice and the uh, bread to you. And if for any reason you're not taking communion today, you can just send them down your your aisle there. Um, But once you get the elements, if you'll hold on to those, because we're going to celebrate, we're going to take the elements all together. All right? Franchot, good morning. Hey, good morning. Good morning, Crossroads. Great to be here. And we'll talk about uh, a word called perspective today. I hope in life that uh, sometimes we get new perspective and it shows us things in life that we may not have seen before. Uh, Right off the bat, I didn't really uh, realize my buddy here was going to have his fire suit on. And we're going to talk about fire. (laughs) Yeah, that's that's my guy right there. (laughs) Didn't know I was going to have. Anyway. Uh, So about five or six weeks ago, I taught a class, uh, me and my colleagues. Uh, We teach it every year uh, at the fire department that I work for, and the officers teach it, and it's called Search and Rescue. And so um, what we do is we have a six-floor tower, training tower, and we put smoke machines in one floor of it, and we smoke it up to where uh, when you open the door to go in, this big wall of smoke hits you, and once you step in, you can't see anymore. So we have these things called thermal imaging cameras that we hold, and um, we can see through it. As officers, we have those on our piece of equipment, uh, but none of our crew can see at all. So they're dependent on us to tell them what we see, where to go, where to find victims, where the fire is, where the escape is, where the stairwell is so we don't fall down it, Uh, things like that. So where their eyes and they have to listen. I brought a picture so that you can see. Um, you see two guys down on their knees at the, at the front, and then the guy that's not so clear in the back is a, is a, a captain that has one of these thermal imaging cameras. Um, my thought was, <clears throat> we taught this class 33 times over three days. It's about an hour and a half long. So about 33 scenarios and uh, about Number 25, I pulled my phone out and I took a picture of the camera that I have as an instructor um, for this uh, class because during this time it hit me how many things, how many principles of searching are relevant to our Christian walk. And so when I finished, I wrote some of those down and I'd like to share them with you just about life about following Christ, what that means. And so um, the purpose of the class in search is to use senses besides our sight because we can't see, except for the one guy with the camera. And then it's imperative on our part as we search to listen to the guy who can see. That sounds a little bit like our walk with God. There are a lot of things in life that we just can't see that uh, we will never know unless we're listening. And as we listen, we're directed and guided towards things that benefit us and others and away from things that may harm us. It works in both places. It's just a different perspective. Another thing that I wrote down was um, sometimes if you get away from your officer, it's just a matter of wandering off because you can't see. It's not that you're disobeying him directly. You just find yourself in the search for victims of wandering off. And then you find yourself lost and disoriented. 
I don't know about you, but there have been seasons in my life where that's happened to me. Well, how do you fix that? In this scenario, if you get away, you get real quiet and you listen for the voice of the one who can see. I think that's right in life, too. I found myself wandering and lost during seasons of my life, and it took me being still and opening my ears to things that I couldn't see, getting back close to him and letting him direct and guide me. And can I say this? It's not even a matter of doing it on purpose. Sometimes we just get away unintentionally. It's not that we're uh, disobedient or rebellious. We just find ourselves in a place where life has gotten busy and we wandered. The last thing I'd like to, to give us some perspective of this is that sometimes uh, there, was, there was a call I was on, a house fire, and I went in, and they were concerned about the roof collapsing, but we went in, and I could see with my camera where the fire was. And I was trying to direct the guy with the water hose where that was. Left, right, up, down. And I finally just got next to him. And I took the camera and I put it where he could see. You know, sometimes we get the perspective of getting close to God. And he lets us see things that we wouldn't otherwise see. By just letting us see what he sees. Man, is that great. Is that a great season to be in? He shows me that, hey, maybe your wife is struggling. Maybe you need to show a little more grace. Hey, maybe your friend needs a phone call. Maybe he needs a text. Hey, why don't you take your encouragement and give it away? Why don't you do that? And he lets us see the fruit of what the way that happens. I was sent a devotional, or I received a devotional, an email that um, it talks about communion. And I'd like to maybe let you see a different perspective of how, as we come to a time of communion, that we can look at that. And I'd like to, to read it to you. It says, each, ob obs each observance of communion is a powerful occasion for faith's confession. In this picture of communion, we as believers confess before all heaven and earth, not only that we believe, but also that we have not forgotten. The words in remembrance involves more than just memory. The word suggests an active calling to mind. Another way to look at that would be that which we set before us to purposefully reflect on. In terms of communion, we're called to remember his sacrifice and what he did, his blood and his body. In 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six, 26, it says, For as often, often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. That word for at the beginning of that verse uh, introduces the reasons for the repetition of communion that we come to. It is an acted sermon, for it proclaims the Lord's death. The outward act of faith in taking the bread and the cup is an ongoing confession. Communion is not simply a ritual remembrance, but a powerful proclamation by which we actively call to memory and receive today all that Jesus provided and promised through his cross. This is the part I like. Each occasion of partaking is an opportunity to say, to proclaim, and to confess again that I am laying hold of all the benefits of Christ's redemption for my life. I'm laying hold of all the benefits of his forgiveness for my sin by his death. And lastly, I'm laying hold of all the benefits of wholeness, of strength, of health, of sufficiency, and provision for my life by our time of communion, which we get to partake in this morning. 
I hope in some sense that gives you a different perspective of why we come to our time of communion. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for your goodness and your love that you pour out on our lives. God, I'm thanking you that we get to come and remember that which you did for us. You did it willingly and freely, not that anyone would take it from you, but that you gave your life for us. God, we thank you for this time that we get to come and be with you, to worship, to sing, to praise, to hear your word, and to take communion. God, we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Spend some time holding the bread and the cup. It's important for us to do that instead of just skipping on by it, getting lost in the schedule. But instead, we get to focus, pause, reflect. And I think that's so important for us to do. Jesus himself encouraged us to do that, to consider the body, to consider the blood. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took the bread, and after he'd given thanks, he broke it and he said, this is my body, broken for you. 
Do this in remembrance of me. Let's eat together. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's drink together. Lord Jesus, we're grateful. We're grateful. Lord, a a million reasons, a million excuses that you could have come up with to avoid the cross. And yet you chose. You went. It wasn't forced. Lord, you willingly went. The love of the Father through the Son, through you, Jesus Christ, we're grateful that through your body, through your blood, that that gap, that chasm that existed, that separation that existed between us and you was bridged. The temple curtain was torn in two. We have access to our Father in heaven. We thank you for that. It's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. I'm inviting you to stand. And uh, we'll have people come around, collect the cups. Um, We're going to dismiss our kids, uh, sorry, kids and teenagers, 8th grade and under, uh, to uh, go to your class. And uh, if you're new to Crossroads and you haven't uh, seen where your kids go, you're more than welcome to follow them out and to uh, connect them up with their teacher. And then come on back up and... Come on back in and worship with us, all right? God bless you.
celebrate today. So today we bow down before you in our hearts and in our lives to say, Jesus, you are the Lord of our lives. Jesus, you are the Lord of my life. Come on, let's just tell him this morning before we're finished with this time. Jesus, be the Lord. You are the Lord of my life. Thank you that you call us your own. Everyone said amen. Amen. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Why don't you guys be seated? So great to worship with you guys today. You may notice that we left this keyboard open for a reason today. It's kind of like an advertisement. I thought it was for me. Well, <laughs> I'm ready if you're ready. The advertisement? It's the advertisement for the keyboard players in the church that would like to be part of the amazing ministry of the worship team. There you go. Stacy Tibbles. <laughs> oh, we're naming names now. <laughs> this could get dangerous. Well, we do welcome you to Crossroads Church. And yes, if you do have a gift or a talent... Um, We'd love, uh, whether it's up here on the platform or somewhere else. Um, you know, that said, oftentimes in church, we get thinking of places to volunteer, places to serve, and we see those as death sentences for the rest of your life in places that it's like, Lord, don't send me to, you know, Africa. And, you know, if we say it, it'll happen. That's not what serving is all about. We believe that serving is something that should be life giving, something that should, as much as you give, you're receiving. And um, I truly believe that those who serve, those who bless, we were even praying before first service here with the worship team that as they walked off the platform each service, they would, wouldn't feel drained. They, in fact, would feel filled up and blessed. And I truly believe that when you serve in your gifting and you're equipped and empowered by the Holy Spirit, uh, that's the, the outcome. People are blessed and, and the filling takes place. So uh, serve, jump on board, find a place where you can fit. Uh, you don't have to be here nine years before you jump in. So uh, how's that for an ongoing advertisement, Pastor Barry? As he walks out now. <laughs> we do welcome you. Uh, for those of you worshiping with us online, I want to welcome you too. Uh, if you're a guest here today, um, I want you to take your phone out and text the word CONNECT to the number that's up on the screen. And you'll get a text message back. It'll have a link, and you can follow that and uh, let us know that you were here in worship with us today. Uh, for those here in the sanctuary, there is also a paper copy of that in the seat back in front of you. Uh, if you feel more comfortable with uh, old school pen and paper, you can do that and invite you to... Uh, uh, our preference would be, if you're new, uh, is to stop by the welcome desk after the service. There's some wonderful people back there who would love to say hi and... Uh, um, 
answer any questions you might have. Uh, that leads into uh, immediately following this service, uh, we have our Discover Crossroads lunch. And uh, uh, a number of people have registered ahead of time, but uh, here is the advertisement, is we have a lot of food, and uh, we'd love for you to join us. If you have not attended the Discover Crossroads lunch, today's your day. Um, immediately following the service, um, Today might be your first day. You might have been here six months or uh, <laughs> six years, and you might have just been putting it off. But uh, we invite you to come, uh, spend a little bit of time with us. We don't keep you a long time, uh, just an opportunity to share with you a little bit of the heart and the vision and values of Crossroads Church and what makes us tick and what God has called us to do and to be here in the city. Uh, a couple other things. One is our kids, our Crossroads kids leave for camp uh, this coming week. Um, actually tomorrow uh, through Thursday, and so we want to be praying for them and praying that the parents who are sending their kids have a good time as well. <laughs> so uh, we know what it's like to send kids off to camp. It's a little bit of a break and a camp for parents too, and uh, uh, it's that season where uh, kids are kind of coming and going, and uh, we do want to pray a prayer of blessing over uh, each of you, your families, and uh, your kids as well. We do thank you for your faithful giving to the Lord and to the ministries of Crossroads Church. Um, many of you give through electronic means, but uh, there are offering boxes located at the back of the sanctuary as well as out in the lobby. And we do thank you for making that a priority. We are truly blessed here at Crossroads. Well, today we are starting our summer series. And now I know it's not officially summer yet, but uh, every year is our annual thing. We do a, uh, a summer series. Uh, this year we're focusing in on prayer. So uh, the months of June and July, um, there are going to be a number of different uh, speakers here on Sundays, and uh, uh, I'm truly excited about uh, where the Lord is leading us to. I invite you to turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6. That's where we're going to be starting today. Back when I was in the sixth grade, I had a buddy named Heath. He was about uh, a head taller than all the rest of us, and about 100 pounds on each of us. Uh, he could... Uh, uh, exert his will and uh, put us in headlocks, and uh, um, uh, Heath was to be respected. Let's just put it that way. But uh, Heath um, didn't grow up in a Christian home. He didn't grow up going to church, and he had tons of questions. And when he found out, when Heath found out that uh, God was a God who was all-powerful, all-knowing, ever-present, when he found out that God was supernatural... Um, he had even more questions. And one of those questions was, does God answer prayer? And being a good Christian kid growing up in church, I learned and I took notes in Sunday school, and the answer to that is yes. Until Heath decides to push the issue and causes all sorts of doubt to come across the sixth grader. So I'll never forget that day. We were over at Heath's house, and uh, we're sitting in his uh, in his room, in uh, this, uh, uh, this den or this rec room, and and uh, there was a sofa that was uh, the back of the sofa was overlooking a uh, picture window that overlooked their backyard. And I'll never forget. We got up on that sofa. We're looking in the backyard, and Heath has this this uh, idea, and he turns to me and he goes, "Embry." He says, okay, um, see my backyard, and you got to know that Heath's dad had to be some sort of mechanic or, or something, because uh, the backyard was not a backyard you'd want to play in. It was full of uh, you know, pieces and parts of cars and engines, motors, uh, everything, tires, and then weeds all over the place. It was a mess. It was a junkyard. The whole backyard was a junkyard, and I'll never forget, Heath, I was looking in the backyard, Heath looks at me and goes, Embry. So God answers prayers, right? And I'm like, yeah, of course he does. You know, I learned that in Sunday school. And he goes, well, if God answers prayers, why don't you pray to him right now and get him to clean up this backyard? I'm like, does he or doesn't he answer prayers? Does he or doesn't he? If I had ever prayed in my life, I was praying then. I was like, on one hand, I was trying to give all these sort of explanations because I knew God didn't quite work like that, but I was in the back of my mind, it's like, well, why doesn't God work like that? And so as I'm explaining to Heath, well, you know, see, God doesn't quite work like that. In the back of my mind, I'm going, God, if there ever was a time that you'd need to clean up a backyard, it would be now. 
Like, imagine Heath and his family, like the spiritual transformation that would go on. And I can come up with all of these good reasons why God should come and clean up that backyard. Uh, Safe to say, God didn't clean up Heath's backyard. But the questions were there, right? Does God answer prayer? What does prayer do? How does this, this interaction happen? What goes on in prayer? This all-powerful God. And, and many times we arrive at that, that conclusion that when God answers prayers, He's real. He exists. And, and then the opposite is true, right? Is We get believing that when He doesn't answer prayers and when He doesn't move and respond, then somehow He's not real or He's disappeared. Hence this on-again, off-again struggle that we have with God and particularly with this conversation, this prayer that we, this prayer life that we have with God. It's almost like that flashing light at the intersection. It's on, then off, then on, then off, then on, then off. And it's like God is there, then He's not, then He's there, then He's not, then He's... And, and how does that lead to a vibrant and, and fulfilling prayer life? And so that's why we're going to look at this over the summer. The fact that prayer is a conversation. I love what uh, that picture that Franchot painted for us. And that, that goes hand in hand with what we're talking about. This, this conversation, this communication with God. You know, I guaranteed a good part of my life, prayer was considered just a one-way street. Uh, when you were a kid, did you used to have a, a, a water balloon launcher? Anyone have a water balloon launcher when you were a kid? Yeah, I think sometimes you feel like that, that's like prayer. You know, you have this, this big water balloon and you're pulling it back and you're letting it go and you don't know where it's going. It's going over the wall, over the fence. It's, and we did that in college. We'd fire it over a building into the quad where people were all gathering and you know, it was raining down water balloons. Confession. But at the same time, it was fun. Uh, but you see, we, we get thinking that prayer is like that. We're just hurling these water balloons over the wall, hoping that they land, hoping that they stick. Just kind of firing them off. But that's not what prayer is. Prayer is a conversation. It's a dialogue. It's this ongoing communication. So we're going to hone in on this over the next six to eight weeks. And today we're going to begin in Matthew, Matthew 6. Matthew 6 is right in the heart of a a section of Scripture called the Sermon on the Mount. It's where Jesus was teaching, and he begins uh, um, focusing in on a lot of the the law. And that it's very easy for us to start seeing the law as just check boxes. Just things, uh, do's and don'ts. And he starts uh, some examples uh, when he says, uh, you've heard it say... In the law, you shouldn't commit adultery. And everyone's going, yeah, yeah, yeah. He says, but I say, even if you look on a woman lustfully, you've committed adultery in your heart. And everyone's going, oh, wow, there's a practical outworking of that. In the same way, he says, you've heard it said, don't commit murder. Don't murder somebody. And everyone's going, yeah, yeah, we don't commit murder. He says, but I say, even if you harbor bitterness or anger toward your brother or sister, you've committed murder in your heart. I was going, oh my goodness. So he's landing the plane into a practical side of things. So this is the context in which he's speaking. And then he moves into another section where he's talking about some specific activities. He talks about giving uh, of resources to the poor. He talks about fasting. And in this section, he talks about prayer. You see, it, it's easy for us to just check boxes. We talked about this uh, many times over the last year where we get into this idea that if we check enough boxes, we put a smile on God's face and our relationship is good. Was that the extent of our relationship with God or is there more? Well, here Jesus focuses in on the heart. What's behind the actions? And take a look at verse 5, starting at verse 5 of Matthew 6. And I want to read this in the message version. It's a little different, but this is a familiar section of Scripture, so I think to get a new perspective and a fresh perspective... I want to read it in the message version. It says this. So this is Jesus' teaching. He says, And when you come before God, or when you pray, don't turn that into a theatrical production either. All of these people making a regular show out of their prayers, hoping for stardom. 
Do you think God sits in a box seat? So the New International Version, it's not up on the screen, but it says, don't be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and the streets to be seen by others. So this is the connotation. He goes on, Jesus says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to find a quiet, secluded place so you won't be tempted to role play before God. Just be there as simply and honestly as you can manage. The focus will shift from you to God and you will begin to sense His grace. The world is full of so-called prayer warriors who are prayer ignorant. New International says, don't go on babbling like the heathens or the pagans. This repetition, this vain religious repetition. Jesus goes on, he says, they are full of formulas and programs and advice. Peddling techniques, forgetting what you want from God. Don't fall for that nonsense This is your father you are dealing with, and he knows better than you what you need. With a God like this loving you, who, uh, sorry, with a God like this loving you, you can pray very simply. And here's where I want to jump over in verse 9 to the New International Version. Again, familiar part of Scripture. Jesus goes on, he says, This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And then Jesus says this, he says, For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. And so here Jesus gives an invitation. He gives a model or a pattern for prayer. It would be very easy for us to just go, okay, chunk, here's the, here's the check boxes, and we just go down and we recite it and uh, say the words and we've done our deed. But that's not what Jesus is teaching. It's more than a script. It's it's more than a religious recipe. And we need to be aware that our tendency is to do that. Okay, what do I need to do? What hurdles do I need to jump over? What is the formula? Just teach me that. Let me get it down and, and I'll be fine. But that's not what this is about. So throughout the series, we're going to look at this. We're going to look at prayer. The practical outworking, the practical uh, conversation that goes on. It, it, it's complex. There's a whole lot of complexity, and yet it's also very simple. It's a formal undertaking, and yet there's something incredibly spontaneous about it as well. I want us to look at this in order to, to leverage this asset. I believe it's something that we are are just scratching the surface on, just the tip of the iceberg, and there's so much more. I want us to take an opportunity and accept this invitation and step into it in a a greater manner. In your bulletin today, you have a a page, and there's some resources on there. Uh, uh, The main part of that is taken from a book that's, uh, that's called How to Pray by Pete Gregg. And uh, it's, it's one way. It's not the way. It, it gives some explanation on, on what some components of prayer uh, would be. Maybe you have a, a different uh, formula or a different uh, outline that you work from. Maybe you've heard different ones. This is just one uh, resource for you. Uh, over the coming weeks, we're going to develop this a little bit, and we're going to uh, continue to give you some resources uh, that hopefully you'll be able to use. You'll see down in the bottom right corner, there's some lists there. There's some websites. There's even some uh, uh, mobile apps that are very, very good. I know a lot of people, they, they see these things as being you know, close to the devil, and there's a whole lot of junk that goes on on these things. But at the same time, there's a lot of good things that you can harness and leverage. Um, one of those, and, and we'll talk about that in just a is, is uh, setting alarms and setting reminders. Uh, it's good for us to be reminded of things, and particularly when it comes to prayer. So I want to just highlight that on an overview. 
Um, you might want to dig into some of those. I invite, I invite you to ask around. Even uh, if you have a resource that we haven't listed there that you found to be very helpful, I'd love to uh, hear from you, and I'd love to, uh, you to share that with me because uh, um, guaranteed there's some other people who could benefit from that as well, and we can include that. But I want you to notice in Matthew 6, when Jesus starts this, he starts this by, by saying, when you pray. Did you notice that? A few verses earlier, he says, when you help the poor. So when you give to the poor. It's not if, it's when. And then he says, when you fast. And everyone said, oh my goodness. But you notice it's not if, it's when. It's assumed, almost like when you breathe. Could you imagine us talking to me saying, hey, the next time you breathe, um, would you... No, it's like it's a given. The next time you eat... You know, if you eat, <laughs> no, I'm eating. <laughs> Trust me, I'm eating. I don't have a problem with that. Uh, when you sleep, um, you know, last night we were watching TV, and I, I tell you, my eyes were just closing. And it's like, it's not if I sleep, it's when I sleep. In the same way, Jesus starts this by saying, when. When you pray, it's not manufactured, it's not cumbersome, it's not ill-fitting. It's not like me saying, oh, good grief, do I have to eat again? It's a matter of saying, I get to. It's something I do with regularity. In the same way, it's, it's that with prayer. Jesus is saying, when you pray. But like breathing or eating or that, there are certain things you should do and certain things you shouldn't do. You think of breathing. If, if you're breathing, there's, there's a couple things. One thing you shouldn't do is hyperventilate. <laughs> you do that enough, you're going down. Like, you're, you know, the world starts getting smaller and you just, you collapse. Similarly, you have to breathe. Don't hold your breath. Um, you know, just try it for a while and you'll just, again, your world will get very small and you'll pass out. So similarly, when it comes to prayer, when you pray, there's some things I want to look at today that Jesus exposes, things we should do, as well as things we shouldn't do. So let's start off at the the top there. He says, when you pray, remember when, not if, when you pray, don't use it to show off. Don't use it to show off. I'm sure all of us, if we had a show of hands, how many of you know someone who loves to show off spiritually in a prayer meeting or, or, or in their spirituality? And we could all you know, name a few people. It, it, it's, it's this tendency. It, you know, I don't know if we do it on purpose or if it's sort of a, you know, feelings of inadequacy or what the motivation is, but it's what people do. And Jesus here is saying, don't use it to show off. Don't use it to posture yourself spiritually. It's not about strutting your piety. In Matthew 6, 5, Jesus says, when you come before God, don't turn that into a theatrical production hoping for stardom. Don't do that. It's almost like the the Pharisee in in, um, uh, Luke 18, where he steps into church and he gets up at the front and, and He says, Lord, I thank you that I am not like that guy over there. That lousy sinner, that swindler, that tax collector, I thank you that I'm so much better than that guy. Is that what we're supposed to do? No. That's not the posture we're supposed to have before God. Where we get to that point where our 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 prayer life becomes something of, of pride. Um, i got to be kind of careful around this subject, but at the same time, it's worth stating. I, I have to admit that there's... I struggle um, from time to time when people say, God told me to do this. And it's not the matter of fact that God doesn't say things or God doesn't speak into our lives, but I think at times it's often used as a well, hey, me and God are like this, and it, it comes very much from a pride position. Now, not always. And I think even at times going down that road a little further, I think at times it, 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 it's kind of maybe given an excuse for a mistake that we're about to make, and we want to blame somebody else. Well, if God told me, then I'm not responsible. It's His fault. You know, there's more in that. But at the same time, I just it's 
what Jesus is focusing in on here is that pride side of things. It's that, well, look at me, posturing ourselves in that position where others think that we're more holy than maybe we really are. So when we pray, keep that humility. Second thing Jesus says is when you pray, quiet down. Set time aside. Slow down. Isolate. Spend that time with Him. Look at Matthew 6.6. 6. Jesus says, when you pray, go into your room. Close the door and pray to your Father. And hear me, this doesn't mean that you can't pray in public. It doesn't mean that you can't pray in a busy place. It doesn't mean that you can't pray in an environment like this. It doesn't mean that you can't pray a couple of seconds before you go into a final exam or job interview. But what it means is your relationship with the Lord will be fostered in those quiet places, in those, in those silent places, in those alone times with Him. And you need to foster that type of relationship. I think the, the time I met Dana, it was at a big youth event, 100, uh, 100 plus people in this, in this place, and I met her. And it wasn't the place I developed the relationship with her. It doesn't mean I didn't say hi to her and she didn't say hi to me. And you know, We met, we talked, but the meaningful relationship and the, the getting to know one another happened away from that big, large group. In the same way, your relationship with the Lord will be fostered in the quietness, in, the, in that secluded place, in that isolation. And I want to encourage you to step in and provide an opportunity for that to happen. Third thing Jesus says is when you pray, pray simply and honestly. I love Pastor Barry from time to time here on Sundays. He says, hey, we're in church. Can we be honest? You know, And we kind of laugh jokingly. Why? Because oftentimes this is a place where we put up the facade. Even in our relationship with God, we put up the facade. What does Jesus say in Matthew 6, 7? He says, when you pray, don't keep on babbling. Don't just keep saying nothing. And throughout this series, we're going to be looking at types of prayers, kinds of prayers. And, and many of us, uh, we only know one type, and that's the, hey, Lord, I need. But do you know that there's other types of prayers, too, of, Lord, I'm struggling? Lord, I'm hurting? You look through uh, the Psalms of David, and there are many prayers of his that were what we call lament psalms. Ones of just saying, Lord, I'm feeling like I'm, I'm between a rock and a hard place. I'm not just between a rock and a hard place. I'm under a rock. And this isn't, I don't have a way out. I don't have a lifeline. And you're my only lifeline. And so being honest with the Lord and developing that. How to speak that to the Lord. Just our, our sadness, our, our joy. Whether we're angry, whether we're anxious, whether we're worried or ashamed or embarrassed. Whatever it is honestly communicating to that to the Lord. And as we step through even the Lord's Prayer over these next number of weeks, we're going to develop that and learn how to do this. And we have to learn how to push through the facade and into those honest places. I remember a pastor friend of mine uh, you know, came up to me one day and he goes, Embry, how's your heart? And I'm like, you know, kind of joking it off. And like, hey, so physically or spiritually? And he goes, come on. How's your heart? How are you spiritually? And I'm, I just had to kind of take a, a breath and in that trusted relationship, able to share with him some things. It's not what we tend to do. It's not something that, that is our, first on our, on our mind. And especially when we come into that relationship with God, we should push on past that facade and into those deeper, more um, vulnerable places. Finally, Jesus says, when you pray. I think it's so good to remember, when you pray. It's not about trying to convince God. It's not about trying to convince Him. I don't know how many of you feel like when you approach God in prayer, it's a matter of, have I done enough? Have I said the right things? Do I have the formula down where He's going to respond Back when I was a kid, um, we didn't have pets growing up, and I know you all have a heavy heart for me right now. I just, you know, I was, uh, I know my parents are listening, and yes, you did scar me for life. Um, but uh, 
I know it was reciprocal. I know I scarred you for life too, more so. But at the same time, I just had to put that in there. But we didn't have pets. And so my, um, my version of pets was, you know, I'd bring home the class um, uh, hermit crab on weekends, you know, and, or the, the hamster or the gerbil, you know, you bring those home on the weekend or for spring break. And that was my version of pet. Well, I would always uh, try to convince my parents that we needed a dog that we needed a pet, we needed, and so I would, um, uh, I'd bring home stray uh, animals, stray uh, dogs from the, from the neighborhood. Uh, it's funny because mom and dad's uh, uh, version of it is I would headlock these things and bring them home. You know, I'd drag them home and they're, you know, backing up, hey dad, mom, I found this dog, this dog followed me home as I'm dragging this dog home. You know, they got the name tag, the collar and everything says, we've found, returned to. And my parents are going, that's the neighbor's dog, just let the thing go, right? Well, there were a few times where genuinely a stray dog would follow me home from school or follow me home. Uh, from the neighborhood, but mom and dad had a pretty strict rule about strays, and that was um, you couldn't feed them, you couldn't bring them in the house, and you couldn't keep them unless they stayed outside overnight and they were there in the morning. Now, I tell you, that's a trifecta of difficulty when you're trying to convince your parents that you need a pet. And so you're talking into that dog's ear, stay here till the morning, please stay here till the morning, and, and I'll give you a juicy steak or whatever. You're making all these deals, right? I don't know how many times I was begging and pleading with mom and dad, please, can I have a dog, please, can I have a dog, you know? Never did it happen except once. There's a story behind that, and your, my parents can tell you the story. The, it was, uh, a dog followed me home, it met all of the criteria, and then had, had five puppies on Christmas Eve. So anyways, yeah, a very needy dog, <laughs> but that was kind of the gift that keeps on giving, right? <laughs> but anyways, I felt like I had to convince my, my parents, and that so many of us feel that way with God. It's like somehow we got to pull a fast one on God or, or give Him enough information or give Him enough stuff so that He'll move. It's like your kid wanting you know, a, a new toy or a, a, a new pair of shoes or a vacation to some exotic place or Disney World. Trying to convince God that this is what is truly needed. And Jesus is saying you don't have to do that. Look like what he says, verse 8 of chapter 6. When you pray, don't think you'll be heard for your many words. Your Father knows, you need, uh, sorry, knows what you need even before you ask Him. Your Father knows that. I love that, that reminder that God is a Father. He's our Father. Other places where Jesus is teaching, He's talking about the love of the Father and that, that God is a God who gives good gifts to His children. If you ask for a bread, if your kid asks for bread, you're not going to give him a stone. And Jesus says, you're evil humans, and you know how to give good gifts to your kids. How much more does your Father in heaven, who is holy, know how to give good gifts? And we get thinking, well, okay, well, then we have needs and we want, have wants. And, and let me just say this, that just like a father, God isn't only interested in your needs. Hear me, he knows your needs, but that's not all he's interested in. Just like your earthly father, your earthly parents, your father in heaven is truly interested in, and yet is going to be discerning about your wants. God knows your wants. God knows the inner desires of your heart. Some of those are, are going to be yes and amen, and there's going to be a green light. Others of them, he's going to say, you know what, I got something different. And in most cases, it's going to be, I got something better. But knowing that God loves to give good gifts, so we don't have to beg and plead and try to convince God in our prayers. Ultimately, it's important for us to remember the heart of God. It's so important to remember who God is and what He's like. Matthew 6, 9 says, With a God like this loving you. I love how Eugene Peterson, the writer of the message version, puts it. He says, With a God like this loving you, you can pray very simply like this. It leads in from there into the Lord's Prayer. You see, God loves you. He adores you. 
He's a loving Father. He's a caring Father. He's a close Father. He's a perfect Father. And we get to approach Him just like that. Yes, there's reverence, but there's just a freedom as well. There's a respect, and yet there's an intimacy. God is a God who is near. God is a God who is not far off. God's a God who loves and cares for and welcomes the conversation with each one of us. I'm inviting the worship team to come join me. I have some homework for you all to do this week. And you're like, oh, I knew there was a catch, right? No, there's some homework. You'll notice in, this, in these verses, Jesus starts with this, when you pray. Homework item number one is start. Start. If you are not in the habit of, or you have not developed a prayer life per se, I invite you to start. Just start somewhere. Like I said, there's some tools there. There's, uh, there's uh, uh, a, an article there that we've shared with you about, about pray, P-R-A-Y, and how to go through those things. Incorporate that. Here's the thing, don't start with an hour. Don't start with 30 minutes. Don't even start with 50 minutes. Start with a minute. Do that. There's a, an app that we shared with you on one side. It's called, the, or it's called um, uh, what's it called? A pause app. A pause app. It'll remind you once or twice a day to spend one minute just stopping. That's it, one minute. You think, ah, oh, man, I can do a minute. Try a minute. I, I tell you, in the middle of the day, mine goes off at 10 in the morning, 2 in the afternoon. It's amazing the number of times I'm incredibly busy at 10 in the morning and 2 in the afternoon. And yet, I tell you, it is a discipline. I, I'd love to say I do it every day. Um, I'd love to even say I do it more than I don't. But and there are some days that are great. There's other days where, you know, it's four or five days, and I'm like, you know what, I really do need to get back to just stopping and pausing. So homework assignment number one, just start. There's a great app in there called Echo that uh, if you download, it's, it's a way for you to itemize some of your, your prayers. And um, it'll, it'll remind you too. It'll set a chime. And you can remind yourself. Uh, start somewhere. That's number one. Um, number two is this, and it goes hand in hand with the resources. Try something new. Try something different. Try. Uh, it's very easy for us to get. Remember we talked about formulas and rituals and kind of the religious check boxes. Try something new. Uh, maybe it's, it's one of these apps. Maybe it's organizing your, your prayers. Maybe it's setting aside um, uh, and, and making a difference between the Lord, I need this, and maybe focusing and praying for some other people. Praying for some big picture things. Praying for our city, praying for some relatives, praying for uh, God's goodness over your neighbors. Try something new. And here's the last part of the assignment, should you choose to accept it, <laughs> is this, is however long you spend, whether it's a minute, whether it's 10 minutes, 30 minutes, whatever the time is, would you try spending half of that time, 50% of that time, just being quiet and listening? I'll tell you right now, and I'll warn you right now, it's going to kill you. It's going to be hard. Um, a lot of us don't like quiet and don't like silence. But trust me, just like Franchot was talking about earlier, listening is so much uh, a part of this communication, this dialogue between us and God. It's just listening. And it's something that we need to develop. So I invite you, start Try something new and spend some time listening, all right? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, right now, guaranteed, uh, a lot of what we've talked about this morning is stuff we've heard before. But Lord, I pray that uh, your Holy Spirit would apply it to our hearts and to our minds and to our schedules and to our lives this week. Lord, we want to develop this relationship. We want to develop this, uh, this communication and Lord, I pray that um, we discover just some really cool and neat things 
discover more about you. We'd discover more about us. We'd discover more about your heart and we'd discover more about your plans for our life. So Lord, I pray for discipline. I pray for reminders. I'm sure we'll get into our busy week and I pray that uh, your Holy Spirit would tap us on the shoulder and reveal to us that we do have some time. And I pray that as we step deeper and deeper into this relationship with you, we see how much we can't live without it. And that we'd see your goodness and your favor and your blessings. And we would see things a little bit more clearly. Just like Franchot talked about that, that screen being put in front of our eyes so we could see into those areas that until now have been hidden from us. We, we want to see you. We want to see more of you. We want to see behind the veil into the supernatural realm. Speak loudly, Lord. Come near. Draw near. Help us to draw near to you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's all stand together. All right. As we stand and we respond with this song. We just make this song a very simple prayer. It's a very simple song. Let's just pray this to the Lord and listen and respond as he speaks to us.
2 Corinthians 13. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Now may the Lord bless you and all those you love now and forevermore. We pray today in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And everyone said amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Hey, I have two things before we go. Number one, we're fixing to have the Discovered Crossroads lunch. If you're somewhat new to Crossroads and would like to have lunch with the pastors and hear from Pastor Darren, uh, we'd love for you to stick around. That will start in 15 minutes. And the second thing is, if we're going to be honest in church, Stacy Tibbles doesn't play the keyboards. She plays the drums. Y'all have a great day.